Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel and it's a rest day before we are going into the final round of the World Championship match between Jan Nepomnici and Ding Li Ren. The score after 13 games is 6.5, six 6.5 and, six and, and both players have won 3 games each. It's an incredible match so far but with one more game to go the pressure on both players is mounting and it's really difficult to say what is going to happen tomorrow in their uh, final round uh, clash when Ding will have the white pieces again. And obviously having white is an advantage at top level. But as you know, it's not a guarantee for success. And well, in the match so far, Ding has won his three games with the white pieces, but it should also be said that he lost um, his first white game in the match with that uh, incredible idea with H3, which is probably not going to be repeated in this match uh, anymore. But the big question is, how are these players going to approach that final round game? Is Napo happy to make a draw with the black pieces? Is Ding with the white pieces willing to take a lot of risk? A lot also depends on their mental state of uh, mind and how do they rate their uh, chances in the uh, potential uh, tiebreak? Well, in order to uh, get a better opinion of what may happen tomorrow, I thought it makes sense to have a look at uh, recent uh, history. And the game I would like to show you is a game from the World Championship match from uh, 2010. Veselin Topalov playing with the white pieces against Fishy Anand. Played in Bulgaria, Sofia. Um, it's game 12. In that time, only 12 games were uh, still played. Nowadays, it's 14 uh, games each. But Topalov playing with the white pieces definitely rated his chances in a potential tiebreak to be um, definitely worse for him. So he really wanted to take a lot of risk. Let's have a look. He opened with 1d4 and we got to see the Queen's Gambit declined. A very solid opening, an opening which has been seen in so many World Championship matches. After the move knight f3, knight f6. Do you remember this position? Here is the move h3 I've been talking about, which was played by Ding in this match against the Napo. But of course, in that time, people were playing more sensibly and uh, we got to see the main line of the Queen's Gambit uh, declined. And well, let me just briefly go through the first couple of moves. Fishy chose a very solid system, anticipating that, okay, a draw is fine. And if Topalov really wants to take risks, well, he, he, got to, uh, he got to do something really bizarre. So this is all pretty uh, pretty standard, has been seen before. It's the so-called uh, Lasker defense with that move uh, 94. And it's offering black a very solid uh, position. After the exchange of knights, d takes c4, b, uh, bishop takes c4. So far, everything all pretty standard. And uh, well, white has a very small stable edge, but here in this position on move 16, Fishy came up with a uh, reasonably uh, new idea, the move knight f6, trying to get this uh, bishop so that if the bishop moves away, black is able to develop its own bishop to the long diagonal. d takes e5 on the board, and now after knight takes e4, queen takes e4, b takes e5, we have a very interesting uh, position in which black is objectively doing fine as it may seem, but of course, uh, there is this weak pawn on c5, which is a potential weakness. And uh, if white would be able to consolidate its position and uh, shift the attention to the c-file, that may become a long-term problem. But in return, black also has his own ideas. There's a half open b-file, the bishop can come to b7. And uh, well, it was clear that Fishy was uh, very well prepared for this. Queen c2 played in later games, the move b3 was played to secure the pawn, but queen c2 looks like a solid move to anticipate the move bishop uh, b7. And now the pawn on c5 cannot really be won because it runs into bishop takes f3, g takes f3, and now the key move rook takes b2, deflecting the queen from uh, the protection of the rook. You can take the rook, but then black is going to take the rook as well with a uh, more or less equal position. Topalov played here the move knight e2, avoiding that uh, weakening of its uh, kingside structure, but black is very active. Rook fd8, so that once again rook takes c5, runs into a rook sacrifice, this time picking up the knight on d2, and it's uh, black who's winning a piece. 
The question is, how is White going to organize pressure against the pawn on c5? Now, the pawn on c5 cannot be taken yet. Maybe a move like knight b3 would have been interesting. Position is still pretty balanced. But what we get to witness in this game is that Topalov decided to play in a very principled way with the move f3, hoping to get in e4 and uh, prove that the bishop on b7 uh, is out of play. But it's a weakening of its king, and he definitely underestimated underestimated the, the safety of his king in this game. Bishop a6 was played, attacking the rook on f1, and the rook went to f2. Also a remarkable move. You would probably expect it, the rook to go somewhere else, maybe to the, to the c file, but uh, things are uh, far from clear. In, in case of a move like queen d7, black is going to tickle the knight by uh, pressurizing along the d file. In the case of knight b3, well, we can even consider a move like uh, like c4 with uh, with reasonable uh, counterplay. Let's see what happened. After rook f2, rook d7 uh, was played. Black is about to double the rooks. And now look what white is going to do. He played g3. And after rook bd8, he placed his king on the second rank. So in, in a way, it's it's a quite a solid defense with all these pieces on the second rank. But every pawn move, it's a weakening uh, one. Black came in with the bishop to d3, attacking the queen. Queen went away to uh, to c1. And now bishop uh, back to uh, to a6, checking what, um, what Topalov is uh, willing to do. So there is this potential uh, repetition of uh, moves if you go queen c2. But definitely it's clear that uh, Topalov uh, estimated his uh, chances really badly for the potential tiebreak and wanted to decide the match in the classical uh, game uh, portion. So he decided to continue with rook a3 and now bishop to b7. The bishop is doing well there. In case of rook takes a7, you have bishop takes f3, picking up the rook in the corner. So the pawn cannot be taken. And instead, knight b3 on the board, attacking the pawn, rook c7, protecting, knight a5, bringing the knight to the side of the board. But the bishop is fantastically placed here on this diagonal. And uh, well, black definitely is looking for ways to start an attack against uh, the white king. Knight c4, and now look, e5 on the board with the idea to uh, to get in uh, e4 very soon, trying to uh, force white to, to push the pawn and uh, and weaken further the, uh, the light squares. So now the move e4 on the board. So this is very interesting position. If white once again is able to consolidate, maybe put a knight on e3, get a rook back to the c file, maybe try to exchange uh, major pieces. The, the end game is potentially really dangerous for uh, for black because of that uh, weak pawn on c5. But having uh, declined the silent uh, draw offer with that repetition of moves, there's also quite a lot of pressure on uh, on white. And look what black is going to uh, to play here. He played the, the key move f5, trying to challenge the pawn on e4 in order to open the diagonal for the um, for the for the bishop and move 31 players were the, were getting lower on time to reach move 40 definitely uh, topalov went astray here you can feel the pressure on that pawn on uh, on e4 he decided to take on f5 but probably it would have been better to maintain a grip on the uh, e4 square he take uh, he takes a five on the board but now e4 that was the main idea it's a real pawn sacrifice with the idea to open up the uh, position so that the black queen is able to join the uh, the attack as well. Things are getting really dangerous. Black is about to um, to take on f3 next and such a pawn on f3 is, is really difficult to, to handle. So the, the main idea was f takes e4, but that's in fact the decisive mistake. There's queen takes e4. You cannot go back to uh, to g1. It leads to checkmate on, uh, on h1. So... Topalov played their king h3, believing the king is relatively safe, but there is rook d4, threatening checkmate on uh, on g4, and that is uh, that's a very unpleasant move to uh, to face. Also, the rook on f2 cannot uh, really help because there are these ideas otherwise to uh, to give a check on uh, on g2. So white played knight e3 to cover the g4 square. But now beautiful resource, which was probably overlooked by Topalov, as the queen would like to give a check. But how to approach the white king? Well, there's this 
Amazing backward move, queen e8. Threatening queen h5 with checkmate. You have to do something about it. The king cannot go away. Look at this rook. Look at the bishop. They're depriving the king from escaping. g4 was played, but now h5 on the board. And there's not much you can do against hg4 and the queen coming in. It's game over. King h4, various ways of playing. Uh, you could consider taking on g4, but even stronger here is the move uh, g5 check, opening up all the files towards uh, the white king. There are there are these ideas to uh, to give a rook check in case you uh, you capture the pawn. It's leading to mate very uh, very soon. So white decided to capture en passant, but now the queen comes in into the attack, and look at white's pieces. They are too far away to uh, to help in defense or to launch a counter attack against. The black king. The black king is wide open, but if the pieces, the white pieces, are unable to get there, there's no reason to uh, to be worried. Rook takes g4, knight takes g4, queen takes g4 is a huge mating threat. So white tried here to move queen f1, so that after rook takes g4, king h3, mate has been avoided at least for the moment, but um, Topalov uh, is still uh, just dead lost. Played here the move. Rook e7, which is a, a beautiful idea with the point of threatening rook takes e3. Eliminating that knight would enable black to give a rook uh, a sacrifice on, uh, on h4 so that the queen can come into uh, to g4 with, uh, with mate next. Rook f8 check was tried in the game, but after king, uh, king g7, everything is um, it's falling apart. For instance, if you do take the bishop, there is this line. I just mentioned rook takes e3, rook takes, a rook h4, beautiful mating attack leading to uh, to checkmate. So the bishop couldn't be taken. Knight f5 check on the board. But now just uh, king h7. Everything is uh, is fine. And uh, once again, the, the rook cannot be taken because of that rook h4 motif. Rook g3 played, but that allowed uh, rook takes rook, h takes rook, queen g4. King h2, rook e2 check with a devastating uh, mating attack as the queen protects the rook. King to g1. And now the simplest move here, rook to g2 check. You cannot go into the corner because that runs into queen h3 with checkmate. And if you go uh, queen takes g2, only move. We get this endgame of uh, queen versus uh, rook and um, and uh, knight, which is uh, winning. Should be added, though, that white may have tried here this move, rook f7. But the finishing touch is king to g6, rook g7, king takes f5. You're sacrificing the queen. Then you take on g4. And after king takes g2, it's a winning pawn end game because the king is sneaking in and uh, white is ending up in uh, in Zugzwang. This king and pawn game was definitely calculated uh, till a win for um, for black. So nothing better than just giving up the queen, but that end game was just uh, deadly uh, lost. Uh, the c pawn is too strong. Black is about to take the pawn on b2 uh, very soon, and uh, well, a few more move moves were uh, were played, but the result was not in um, in doubt at uh, at all. So you see that uh, taking a lot of risks with uh, with white can uh, work against you, and this costed uh, the World uh, Championship uh, title for, uh, for Topalov. In the end, he uh, lost the pawn on B2 and it was time to, uh, to resign. So playing for, for a win with the white pieces at any cost is a very dangerous approach. Let me show you two other quick, uh, quick examples. For instance, one from the World Championship match in 2016. Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces playing his final round against Sergei uh, Karyakin. And he went for a relatively boring line of the, um, of the uh, Rue Lopez, this Berlin uh, variation where everything gets uh, swapped. I, I briefly go through the uh, moves because the game itself is not too interesting. The Berlin defense is a typical opening at the highest level. And um, Magnus, he surprised everyone by going for this line because it's considered to be uh, pretty harmless. But look what he did. He, after developing all the pieces, Black was about to uh, to go for the exchange of uh, of pieces, and uh, Magnus didn't mind. He just cooperated. Everything was uh, swapped. It was his final white game of the match. Everything came off the board, 
And well, he said, uh, well, a draw is okay. And uh, I don't mind spoiling my, my white game as I do rate my chances in the tiebreak higher. It's, there's a bigger chance to, to win in the tiebreak than uh, where you have at least four rapid games to, to play than one classical game, because it's very difficult to prove anything in, um, in this opening. So he was not willing to take any risk. And the same happened in, uh, in 2018 when he was playing with the black pieces against uh, Fabiano Caruana. It was a really sharp game, but after his move uh, Rook A8, he, um, he's in control and White can do absolutely nothing. But he offered a draw and uh, Fabiano was happy to accept the, the draw. And uh, we all know what happened in that uh, tie break because uh, he had absolutely zero chance and uh, Magnus convincingly won. But it's interesting yeah, that you're playing with the black pieces, you have an advantage, but still he felt that it's really difficult to, uh, to break through. And uh, I think that objectively, if black would go for bishop d7, get the rook involved, trying to prepare a pawn break with b5 or maybe at the right moment a3, you're not risking anything. But you can see the tension at this point. It's the final round uh, game of the match. It's unbearable for, uh, for both players. And you see that even Magnus, he wanted to escape. He wanted to go into the tiebreak. And I'm curious to see what is going to happen uh, tomorrow in the, uh, in the final round game, game 14 of the match, Ding against uh, Napo. And what kind of scenario we will get to see? Is Ding really going to take a lot of risks and uh, uh, trying to, to win at any cost? His score with the white pieces is, uh, is fantastic. He won three games with the white pieces. He lost one as well. But we also should not forget his last white game, game 12, in which he was on the verge of defeat. And uh, Naples was really close in uh, sealing the, the match. So... I'm curious to see what, uh, what is going to happen. Does Napo get a chance? Is he willing to play for more than, uh, than a draw? All these questions, they, uh, they are unanswered, at least for the moment. But hopefully we know more tomorrow. Or in case of a, a draw, we get to see another fantastic uh, tie break on, uh, on Sunday. Thanks for watching. I hope you like this preview of the final round uh, game of the World Championship match. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And I will see you soon again.